All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Sierra Graham, and I will be your MC and your moderator for the evening. Thank you so much for jo joining our virtual panel discussion titled Courageous Conversations, Voter Misinformation and Suppression in the US Election. The panel is hosted by Everett Community College Business and Applied Technology Division. This event is part of the Everett Community College Trojans Vote Initiative with the end goal of providing voter education to students, staff, faculty, and community members. We're 12 days away from what some people may call the most critical election in our nation's history. I know there are some of us in the audience who are voting for the first time, and some of us may feel overwhelmed by the abundance of information that we're receiving about voting in this election. This overabundance of information coupled with the toll that this global pandemic has had on us can lead us to feel mentally exhausted. I'm excited to hear from an esteemed group of panelists who are cybersecurity experts and city and county level leaders. They are going to help us understand the voting process, debunk myths about our election process, and illustrate the reality of voter suppression and, and intimidation in the United States. Everett Community College has done a superb job in encouraging students to register to vote and be informed voters. The Trojans Vote Initiative is reflective of our continued commitment to improving the lives of our students and community. And our president, Dr. Daria Willis, has played a key role in this initiative and in encouraging students to exercise their voice. So I would like to now introduce our president, Dr. Daria Willis, who will provide a welcome. Thank you, Dr. Graham, and thank you everyone for taking the time with us this evening to learn more about um, voter suppression and what we could each do uh, to make sure that that does not happen in this election and our role uh, and our civic duty in voting this year. I also want to thank uh, the panelists that are here with us today, uh, the organizers of this event, because without you, we would not be here. Um, so thank you very much for your initiative, your willingness and your courage to uh, be part of this conversation. Voter suppression is definitely a real thing and voting in this election is our civic duty. Uh, at EVCC, as Dr. Graham noted, we are encouraging our students, faculty, staff, and community members to participate in our hashtag Trojans Vote campaign. We're asking all people to not only vote with yourself, but take somebody to that mail, that, that voter box with you, uh, take a picture while you are voting and placing your ballot in the box and then post it on social media. Because whether you know it or not, those types of posts really help to encourage other people to go out and to vote and to vote early. So with that, again, I just want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and we are surely watching closely what happens in this election. Our lives depend on it. Our children's lives depend on voting and our community. So please enjoy the panel, ask questions and don't forget to go vote. And when you do, hashtag Trojans vote in your social media posts. Thank you so much and enjoy the evening. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Willis, for your welcome. And I cannot reiterate your point enough. Please vote, it's important. Um, you know, we are voting uh, for our community and for the health of our nation. Um, during this panel, we also encourage you to use the hashtag Trojans Vote on social media to share information about this event. Now, here comes the moment that many of you have been waiting for. I will have each of the panelists introduce themselves to the audience. And I request that the panelists share a little bit about who they are, their name, their position title, um, the work that they're involved in, and then why um, they are involved in this panel discussion. Um, so Maggie, um, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Garth, um, Dr. Green, and then in with Dennis. 
Thank you so much, Sierra. I'm really honored to be here, and I was so, uh, you know, generously invited uh, to, uh, by Dennis to be here. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Voting Machine Hacking Village at DEF CON, which is a hacker conference uh, that's normally held every summer in Vegas, not this year. Uh, I've been involved in election security for about 10 years now, uh, doing a lot of pro bono work and some and a, a, a certain amount of cybersecurity consulting work as well, uh, basically promoting um, things like risk limiting audits and things like that. And basically, uh, I'm, uh, I care deeply about this issue. I think uh, democracy is uh, just key and, and it's kind of the underpinning of all other activist work or, or work for good that we can do in general on a policy level. If the vote can't be trusted, then sort of everything else falls apart. So I'm extremely passionate about this issue and, and election integrity and really honored to be here with all these other experts. All right, uh, I'll, uh, I'll introduce myself now. Uh, my name is Garth Fell. I'm the Snohomish County Auditor. Uh, I have uh, been in this position as, as auditor for the last uh, 11 months. I was elected last year, but uh, I do have uh, 20 years of experience in elections administration. The last 12 is Snohomish County's elections manager. And the auditor's office is responsible for conducting all federal, state, and local elections here in Snohomish County. So. Uh, I'm here tonight, uh, one, to, to hopefully share some, some good information about uh, our processes in Snohomish County itself, and also uh, really to learn. We've got a, a, a wonderful group of, of speakers here, and, and every opportunity I can get to gather more information and, and hear from the community, too, in terms of what we uh, are interested in and, and the things that we believe are important in our voting system. Uh, is, is a great opportunity for me to, to, to grow and, and hopefully uh, influence uh, the coming election and and the future elections as well. Uh, hello, my name is Dennis Scar. I'm tenured faculty here at Everett Community College, and I teach information security cl classes. Um, my background is actually critical infrastructure protection, looking at how you can actually secure things like electrical systems, water, uh, airfields, uh, heating and ventil ventilating, air conditioning. You know, things that actually kind of uh, like power uh, all of our different things. And I'm kind of an accidental election security expert because my experience comes from the Washington Air National Guard where we were securing all these different uh, critical systems. And when voting came along, I was nudged to say, hey, we need to go figure out this voting system. So with that, I performed multiple uh, voting security assessments here in Washington state with uh, a joint operation between the Washington Air National Guard and our state guard. And I spent many summers uh, visiting Maggie at the DEF CON voting village who actually get very smart to understand the different nuances in these voting systems. Uh, elections are very important to me. Uh, it was very different to actually start digging into this uh, kind of field because I'm used to devices that were, these, you know, you have a cyber impact that actually results into some sort of physical damage. But as we were kind of looking at voting, we realized that our minds were potentially being hacked. And to me, that was very frightening. So this is uh, a very close subject to me. And I thank all of our panelists for coming out. All right, and Dr. Green. Hi, my name is Janice Green. I have been a longtime resident of Snohomish County and I'm the president of the NAACP of the Snohomish County branch. I'm very interested in the subject because historically, African Americans and other people of color have been disenfranchised and have not been able to vote and to the point that even today the Voters' Right Act has not passed. So we see um, kind of diminishing opportunities for votes, uh, for people to vote. Uh, over time, I think that uh, we need to really pay attention to all the legislation and what's the leadership of the country it's doing as far as suppressing votes and makes a big difference in our world and makes a diff big difference in how people live and what comes what the, how their children live as, as Dr. Willis said. So this is a very important topic. I'm glad to be here. And I think we're gonna talk more about voter suppression and how to fight that. All right, well, thank you all for your wonderful introductions. And just to give the audience an idea of how this panel will work. So I have about six questions that I will pose to the panelists. And we anticipate that this discussion will last about 40 to 50 minutes. And after that, there will be time for audience question and answer. And that will last about 20 minutes. 
So I encourage the audience to ask questions via the YouTube chat feature um, and questions will be posed to the panelists in the order in which they are received. And after the audience Q&A, we will close out the event with a testimony from an Everett Community College student who will be registering to vote for the first time in this year's election. So without further ado, let's get started. So I think I speak for a lot of people here that I was so excited to receive my ballot early and take it down to the ballot drop box. And I know that Washington state is primarily a vote by mail state, um, but I know that isn't the case for every state. So Garth, um, for those of us who are, you know, first time voters or were a little bit unsure about the different voting methods, can you share what the differences are between voting absentee by mail and in person and then which is the most secure? That's a, that's a great question and a very interesting question. So I, I think, uh, you know, in general, voting in person involves uh, the individual voter going to a location uh, where uh, poll workers uh, check their status as a voter and then issue them a ballot to cast their, their vote in, a, in person in some location, put that in a ballot box, and then, then the, um, the ballot gets counted either at the location itself or taken someplace to, to be counted centrally um, on voting equipment. Uh, in terms of how that differs from an absentee ballot, uh, absentee situation is where a voter typically will make a request that might be a one-time request for a ballot, or it may be a, a request to receive all of their ballots in the future by mail. Um, and, uh, and, and once they make that request, they'll get a ballot in the mail to vote and return to the elections office. And uh, at that point, the ballot will be tabulated uh, centrally on, on um, vote counting equipment. And then uh, the by mail option is where uh, counties or, or jurisdictions move to a, a system where they mail every voter a ballot at the, at the beginning. You don't have to make that request. It is the default process by, by which voting happens. And uh, the ballot is, is sent to the voter to, to fill out and complete and send back. Uh, all of these methods have different uh, steps involved to try to ensure that the only, only voters that are eligible are, are voting. Uh, on the absentee and mail ballot side, uh, voters are required to provide signatures, which are matched against signatures that uh, the county or the jurisdiction has on file for the voter. There are other steps in place to, to account for ballots as well. I, when, you, when you look at it um, uh, in, in reality, there isn't one system that's used typically any one place. It's not a pure in-person voting system. The most, most places across the nation have an option for an absentee ballot. Uh, some require a reason to get an absentee ballot and it's much more restricted, but, but they have some, sort of, some form of absentee ballot. Even in our environment where we're voting by mail, we still have the ability for uh, voters that um, uh, need to use in-person equipment either for, uh, because they have a, a, a disability that um, prevents them from casting an independent private ballot. We have, we have those in-person options for, for voters as well, even in this vote by mail. So, so you're never really seeing a pure vote by mail a polling place system, there's, there's always some variation. Um, and, and so here in Washington state, we are what's called a vote by mail state. We've been doing this for 15 years in Snohomish County, uh, the last nine years statewide. And um, uh, again, we still, even in a vote by mail environment have some uh, in-person options, uh, but we, we, we do believe that the, the method that we have um, is, a, is a secure method. Uh, in terms of what method is more secure than another, because they are processes and they involve people and equipment and things, it really depends on all of those procedures and processes and how they come together. So um, any, any one method could be more secure in one jurisdiction than another, just based on those groupings of procedures and equipment and people. And, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm confident in our system here in Washington state. We've got a lot of checks and balances in place to make sure that voters can receive a ballot, uh, can get that ballot back in a secure way, um, either through a, the, the post office or through a ballot drop box if they choose, um, and, and that those ballots will be counted appropriately. 
I know later on in this discussion, we may talk about the auditing methods and other things as well. So there's there's other tools in place that you can use to, to give you a greater confidence in, in the results and ensure that um, uh, voters can have confidence in, in how uh, their votes were cast and, and counted. So. All right, thank you so much, Garth. Um, so Maggie, I'd love to hear from you um, in terms of how this kind of plays out on a national level and your thoughts on just what methods are, are kind of the most secure. So there's a really important question to establish here, which is uh, what do you mean by secure? If you mean in terms of like the tabulation is going to be hacked, uh, I would say don't don't in general worry about that. Uh, there's no real proven cases. There's one ongoing lawsuit, but that it's not rampant by any means and no reputable expert will tell you that it is. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, I will say if you mean in terms of like uh, another type of security, which is like your ability as a voter to vote, voter suppression, uh, that is another matter entirely as far as security goes. And I would definitely say it depends on where you are. Uh, if you're in an urban area, it could be very different in terms of crowds. And you also have to take COVID into, you know, into um, consideration and your own risk level with COVID as far as voting securely goes. I would basically, uh, earlier this month, I might've said, if you have the option to do absentee or, or mail-in of some kind, do that, get your ballot, return it as quickly as possible. Paper ballots are always the preferred um, me uh, medium. Uh, especially optical scan by security experts. Uh, it, it is a uh, anonymous um, permanent you know, record more or less of the voter's intent. And it allows us to do things like recounts and audits after the fact, unlike you know, touch screen machines and things like that, which we were, hope, were hoping to phase out as quickly as possible because of their insecurities. Um, if you're now at a point now, which is very common that absentee is not, you know, isn't uh, possible for you, or you might not get it in in time. Some states you have to have postmarked by election day. Some you need to have in by election day. Uh, and that varies also from state to state. It can be very confusing. Uh, if you have an option to do early voting, I would certainly urge you to do that. But keep in mind, there might be longer lines on early voting in certain, in certain areas because there are fewer poll workers and fewer machines available during early voting. Uh, so don't be discouraged necessarily, like if your first day of early voting is very crowded or think that there's automatically meaning that something wrong has happened. Uh, it could just be a limited resource at that point. Um, but then again, if you're in a rural area and you've never had to wait in your life uh, to vote, uh, maybe in person on election day is best for you. Uh, you know, as far as making sure your vote is counted and there's no shenanigans as far as maybe you're, you didn't match your signature to your DMV, you know, license and therefore they've decided arbitrarily that your signature should get thrown out or something, you know, hokey like that. Obviously that would be the most, you know, guaranteed. Uh, but I would definitely say consider your risk level, consider historically how long the line has been for that area. Um, and, and keep in mind, it's totally normal that people can't take out an hour or two to vote. And that hasn't, you know, and that there's no shame in that. That's just reality. Um, one thing I might recommend is go at a time if you can, and this is not feasible for everybody, go at a time that you'd go if you wanted the gym to be empty, like go around 10 a.m. You know, non-usual business hours generally tend to have shorter lines. Uh, first thing in the morning, always the longest line, uh, more so than even after work. So I, I, I'm not sure, I hope that answers your question, but like, I would definitely say, consider your risk factors Consider the historical, you know, the laws in your in your area, and consider what it's been like historically in your area to vote uh, when taking all that into consideration. Yeah, and I I can clarify a few things just about uh, Snohomish County and and how things are are working here. Uh, so we are uh, can, again uh, we've mailed out ballots to everybody at this point. You still have the option to register uh, up in till uh, Monday online and by mail. And then even after a Monday, you can register in person until eight o'clock on election night. So we have uh, same day in-person registration and, and get a ballot. Uh, if you come to show up and in person to vote, the ballot that we will be um, providing is the same as the mail ballot that uh, you would get if, if you received it through the mail. So it is still a paper ballot and it, uh, it includes all the instructions and envelopes that, uh, that you can use. Uh, the, um, so, so if you're getting a ballot uh, in the mail already, I would encourage you to use that ballot first before showing up in person. There's no difference between the ballot that you're going to get. Um, being vote by mail, we do have a, a limited number of sites available for in-person uh, registration. And uh, so the, we'll have one in North County at uh, the Wyndham Gardens Hotel. We have one at the county campus and then one in South County in Linwood at the 
Alder, Alderwood Water and Wastewater District. And all that information is available on our website and uh, available in the packet that uh, you should, should have received as a, as a voter. Uh, we also have in Washington State the ability to download a ballot from the internet uh, after a replacement ballot. So if you uh, register to vote uh, here uh, late in the process and are concerned that the ballot that we send you will not arrive on time, you can always go to, to the internet, look yourself up on the statewide uh, system and download a ballot. Um, and uh, rest assured that we are only accepting one ballot per voter. And we do check the signatures on those envelopes to make sure that they match the signature we have on file and uh, do other uh, checks as well to ensure that, that uh, uh, somebody can't vote more than, more than once in the process. All right, thank you so much, Maggie and Garth. Um, super helpful to kind of understand the different voting methods and the security of each method. Um, and I hope people are taking notes. Um, so let's move to the topic of voter suppression. So back in August, we celebrated the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Um, in signing the act in 1986, President Lyndon Johnson pledge that no one would be denied the right to vote based on race. This act helps solidify our commitment to equity and fairness in our democracy. Voting rights are currently under attack nationwide as states pass voter suppression laws. These measures include cuts to early voting, voter ID laws, and purges of voter rolls. My next question is, what have been some of the past and current practices that have contributed to voting not being accessible for historically disadvantaged groups? And what is your definition of a fair and secure election? And Dr. Janice Green, let's start with you. Yes, I, I would like to say on that one, um, you know, recent activities with the court that took down some of the voter, voters' rights um, protections has really impacted our voters' rights. You'll see things that are happening now that uh, weren't happening before that happened. But I also like to talk to you about historically people think of voters' rights or not having voters' rights or suppression being a southern something that happens in the South. But it's historically all of the United States. If you look at Pennsylvania in the 1800s, they put laws in place that required assessors to go door to door. Uh, 30 years after that, California passed legislation make it difficult for immigrants to register because of fears of voter fraud. So this fear of voter fraud has gone through uh, generations. Uh, redistricting, as we saw in Ohio and the gerrymandering, this cuts people out of their ability to, to vote or else they can vote, but their vote doesn't count the way it would if it wasn't, if it wasn't for gerrymander, ger gerrymandering. We look at um, the stories historically, I mean, anecdotally, my parents will tell you that in order to vote, maybe you had to figure out how many jelly beans were in a, a bottle, but if you, and literary text tests were rampant and for disenfranchised voters. And let's not forget the poll watchers. So when I say we start cycling back and we start talking about poll watchers, and I don't mean the legitimate ones, the ones that the uh, election that, that are certified to be poll watchers, because I think that everybody should take advantage of that because that keeps the integrity of our elections if we have both the Democrats and Republicans and other citizens watching to see, make sure that uh, it's being done correctly. I'm talking about the call for having people come watch the ballot boxes, having people that aren't certified, having people intimidating voters trying to suppress the vote. And that's what we're seeing now, but that is historical as well, because at one point, people that wanted to vote, if black person wanted to vote, they risked their lives to do that. They risked their lives to vote. Um, so we have to keep those things in mind. So the, sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. And now we have on top of all of that, on top of poll taxes and literary texts and, and disenfranchised voters, now we have social media. And social media also acts to suppress the vote. We have misinformation, it promotes misinformation, uh, that suppresses the vote. We have Russian bots, and now from what I heard today, we have Iranian bots in China, China weighs in too. And we have fake accounts and misinformation. So, People need to be really clear 
that they're paying attention, that they're doing the fact check, that they're not just staying home because of information they received from Facebook that has nothing to do with their ability to vote. Um, that's critical. And the other thing is, we asked what my definition uh, is, I think everyone should have the opportunity to vote if they're eligible. And when I mean eligible, I don't mean the made up kind of rules that people make to keep people from voting, because that's the same as, uh, that's for suppression, it's, it's been going on for a while. I'm talking about they're eligible to vote. Um, they should be able to vote. And that includes folks that have been in prison and released and serve their time. There's just so many things that people, the rules that people make up. And we need to be well aware of that and that we're not falling for that. So I suggest you should vote if you're registered. If there's any intimidation, you need to let people know and you need to be paying close attention to means and ways that people are trying to keep you from voting, voting and suppressing your vote. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Green. Um, Dennis, um, would love to hear uh, your opinions on this question, um, just given your understanding of historical and current voter su uh, suppression practices, as well as your definition of what constitutes a fair election. Yeah, thank you. So I kind of like really look at it from the lens of like day one of information security class of the, the CIA triangle, you know, you have confidentiality, you have integrity, and you have availability. So confidentiality, you know, my vote is, is conf confidential, you know, I should have the right to actually keep that to myself. Yes, I kind of exercise this process. Integrity, you know, to ensure that my vote is um, where I can actually deliver it. Uh, it's accounted. I can actually check through some sort of system that, that it actually has been received and processed. And even beyond just the voting process when it comes to integrity, the information that I'm consuming to actually make this decision, you know, I feel like, you know, I should be given proper vetted information, you know, the, the stream of misinformation and disinformation kind of coming in through our social media streams and being laundered through different media outlets, you know, is, is designed to confuse us to have us check out of the process or possibly just vote for something that, that is not, not accurate. So the integrity of information we consume, I think is also extremely important. And then availability, you know, we just started talking about voter suppression. You know, I, sh I should have access to the polling station. You know, I, I shouldn't have to wait in the rain for four hours. It should, be, it should be an easy process. There shouldn't be any intimidation along the way. You know, I need availability to, uh, through this process to actually kind of exercise my right. All right, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, Maggie, would love to hear from you as well. In, can, you, can you reframe the question? Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, what is your understanding of voter suppression um, practices, both historically and currently? And then what is your definition of a fair and secure election? Uh, certainly. I would say that um, my specialty, along with election integrity of voting machines, is not focused on voter suppression. It's not something that I would consider myself an expert in. I am an observer of it, though, uh, just through, in, you know, a familiarity with election security in general and how that can be used as a vector for voter suppression. So I will say, like, when we're looking at things like, um, you know, tabulation integrity, we're not, we're not questioning whether anybody who voted uh, should vote or something like that, ridiculous like that. We, we are assuming that all the voters are legitimate. But I will say that certainly, um, uh, you know, these claims of voter fraud are being used uh, massively and, and, and I think in bad faith uh, for voter suppression. For example, I had a talk I gave earlier where I had the Heritage Foundation numbers up and they're one of the most vociferous, you know, campaigners on the issue of, you know, voter fraud. And they said there's a whole, whole 1200 confirmed cases uh, and counting. And um, that's since 1948, uh, <laughs> which is crazy, uh, you know, that they would consider that a major threat. And, uh, and it's hard to take seriously, even when their own numbers are so incredibly low. And uh, I think only 300 of those are even in the last in the 21st century. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of how many ballots have been cast in the 21st century, of course. So, you know, voter suppression is, is very real. Um, it's, it's, it's um, 
it's being used, uh, voter fraud is being used for voter suppression, I guess would be my, my end thing on that. And, it, and it definitely it's, it's a major concern, but I would definitely defer to experts uh, like Dr. Green uh, in terms of talking about its historical impact and, and how it's going on in general. All right, thank you, Maggie. And Garth, um, also, if you can answer the same question, um, your understanding of historical and current voter suppression practices, and what is your definition of a fair and secure election? Yeah, so uh, I thought Dr. Green did a great job of identifying a lot of the historical um, barriers to uh, accessing a ballot. And uh, I would just add to that that um, as we look at the voting systems that we have and the processes in place, those can be designed with barriers as well. Uh, you know, we people have economic barriers to getting to a poll because they have to work or they can't get a, they don't have child care and other uh, uh, ways to, to get to the ballot uh, box and, and to, to, to vote their vote their ballot. And so I think in looking at systems and, and how we're designing our voting systems, making sure that we have plenty of options for people, plenty of opportunity for people is important. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the misinformation, I, I would agree that's a huge thing we're seeing now, just um, trying to prevent people from wanting to take part in the process to begin with, just because they don't feel like they, they can trust the process. And so uh, I, I hope tonight uh, we're able to, to convey that people should have confidence in the process. No process is perfect. I don't think any of us would say that. There's, there's a perfect process, um, but, but I think people can have confidence in the results. And that... Uh, when I get to my definition of fair and, and secure, really, it comes down to that. Can you, can you access a ballot? Do you have, uh, are there, are there uh, no barriers to, to getting that ballot in the first place? And do you know once you cast that ballot, it will be accurately counted and that, the, that you can actually see that, that uh, through a, a, a documented chain of custody and an audit process? So I think, I think those are really the keys for me are making sure there's access um, and that, uh, and that there's an accurate and documented vote counting process. All right, thank you all. Um, really appreciate your thoughtful responses. Um, so I think it was Maggie who said uh, voter fraud um, is an example of voter um, suppression. Um, so let's move into that topic next. Um, so during the presidential debate, Donald Trump claimed that mail ballots could be manipulated and that this is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. Washington moved to vote by mail elections in 2011. How much fraud have we seen over the last nine years here in Washington or in other states with vote at home systems? Um, so Maggie, I'm gonna start with you for this question. Well, I, I will definitely defer to people on the ground like Garth when it comes to actually what's happening in Washington. But I will say that like um, this idea that, you know, um, that uh, vote by mail favors one party or the other, or, you know, uh, Washington is trying to, or some other state is, you know, uh, you know, liberal and therefore doing it or, or vice versa uh, is ridiculous because I mean, another known state uh, for vote by mail is Utah, which is a, a, a you know, particularly uh, right-wing state, uh, for example. So we've actually seen studies on vote by mail to see if it's partisan in any way. And actually the only thing that came out of it was that it slightly favors uh, Republicans because it um, many states have restrictions on vote by mail, which are age-based in terms of having no excuse and, and older voters do tend to trend a little more Republican, uh, but it was a very, very slight difference. So the idea that um, vote by mail is going to favor one party or the other, uh, which I took to be the core, uh, you know, origin of that accusation in the first place to try to, dis, you know, to try to um, discredit one party or the other's um, support uh, is, is not supported by any sort of studies. And I would definitely say that um, vote by mail be, it has been going on since the Civil War. Um, we've had over 100 years to secure it. And, uh, and it's been a long and hard road, but I, I, it, I've never seen a study that says it's any less secure than any other method. Um, 
and not a good faith one, certainly. And a lot of these um, accusations around what could go wrong, these sort of like uh, breathless, hysterical, like, you know, hundreds of ballots are going to come in from overseas um, is, is uh, sort of ridiculous and shows a complete lack of understanding of, you know, the checks that, you know, what happens when you're checking off voter ballots. It's not as if like, uh, you know, I could send in a hundred ballots under my name and all of them would just be taken and put through the machine. Obviously I would be checked off the list. And if I sent in 99 more ballots, they'd probably call me up and there'd probably be a pretty serious investigation into why I sent 99 ballots. Uh, or somebody in my name sent 99 ballots. Now, in theory, I could be disenfranchised with this. Somebody could, you know, send in a ballot before me and match my signature and, and get everything right about me. Uh, at, at that point, we'd have just, it's an insider threat of a certain sort. Like you, you just have total access to like my ballot before I can get to my own post box to get it for example, um, which, uh, you know, is, is a level of control that isn't necessarily easy to scale. So even if there's some, like maybe some localized threats, maybe even in local elections, you could try to do some sort of stuffing or whatever it, on a federal, on a, you know, on a federal presidential level, it's just, it's a non-issue. And it's, um, it seems like a bad faith argument to me, to be honest. And I say this even as a, from a nonpartisan angle. All right, thank you, Maggie. And uh, Dr. Janice Green um, would also love to hear um, your opinions on this question as a leader in Snohomish County. Um, how much fraud have we seen over the last nine years in Washington state? Uh, but also if you could maybe highlight some of the work that the NAACP of Snohomish County is doing to educate people about voter fraud. Sure. We actually, um, you know, I'll, I'll just go back to say President Trump says a lot of things and a lot of those things I think you need to fact check because um, they may not be true. And when it comes down to voter fraud, I, I listen to the experts and that's not true. So and because it's been investigated over and over again, there's been no evidence of widespread voter fraud and there are not ballots being manufactured and there are not ballots that be thousands of millions of ballots being thrown over into the river. But I will say for the NAAP, NAACP, this is a critical piece. We have been doing get out the vote and register in this county. It's more about getting people out the vote, I think, than registering the vote to vote, although both are important. We have a low voter turnout, like 30 something percent, 40 something percent, between 30 and 40. And it's imperative that we get people out to vote. This year, we spent a lot of time getting people registered to vote. We've had uh, a lot of activity in that place, both on our website and uh, phone calls and personal, you know, pers getting people, telling each one, bring one or two people with you to the polls. Um, so it's, critical and I, I hope people realize how important it is for our democracy for us to get out there and vote and even if it's the president of the United States telling you something that's not true fact check that and make sure that you don't let your vote get suppressed don't listen to I mean I hear they want people at the polls people coming to the polls to watch the polls and those people aren't certified to do that if people are showing up with uh, with guns or other types of, you know, other type of the threatening behavior, uh, that needs to be stopped. And I think it needs to be reported. And we need to be all on our, on all on our guard, but that's, we all need to make sure that we're voting and we're not suppressed. I get a lot of, I, I get a lot out of watching some of the folks like in Georgia and other places that have to stand in line for hours, but they are gonna get their votes counted. And I think that it's not that difficult here in Snohomish County. We're not gonna be standing in line. Hopefully we're not gonna be threatened. And the suppression is coming from uh, misinformation more than anything else, I think right now. So we just need to be on our guard and fact check and do our own thinking and make sure we get to the polls. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Green. Um, so Garth, as the, the county auditor, if you could maybe shed some light on um, just voter fraud in Washington state um, and um, maybe you know what the county is kind of doing to not only educate people um, about it, but um, you know maybe helping prevent it as well. Yeah, so uh, I, I would agree with what I've heard so far. There is uh, really no um, no record of fraud in Washington state um, associated with vote by mail. I, I think the first thing that we need to, to think about is fraud, the definition of fraud has intent in it. And so 
It is somebody that is trying to do something uh, to gain uh, personal advantage or financial advantage as a result of, of certain actions. And so uh, we occasionally see things in, in the elections process that are, that are errors or issues that, that uh, come up. And uh, I think we need to be quick not to uh, to, to, to look at those for what they are and not to try to attribute that to fraud of some sort. Uh, I think that that can happen um, quite frequently, depending on uh, quite, quite honestly, who's, who's winning and who's losing a particular race. I think, I think there's, there's some vested interests there uh, when, when it comes to looking at results and, and issues uh, around elections. So, um, so I, I think we have a long history, uh, again, in, in Snohomish County specifically, of, of well-run elections. I think uh, our history of recounts and how those have, have bore out the uh, original counts um, uh, is also a, a good indicator of um, just uh, how well-run the elections are here in Washington State and, and in Snohomish County. So uh, that, uh, again, on the, uh, when you come to the voter suppression side, um, uh, just this whole conversation about uh, fraud involved in, in vote by mail uh, is, is it's concerning because the people that will actually decide this election are probably the ones that don't show up to vote. Uh, the fact that it will ha we'll still have a large group of people that could be eligible to participate that will not get involved. And so uh, we really need everybody to uh, um, register and, and get, get their ballots in uh, this election. And uh, so I would I would, uh, again, uh, kind of echo the, the comments of, of the other panelists that uh, fraud is, is not a, um, an issue here in Washington state. It's not uh, a, a major issue nationally. And again, the, the statistics bear that out and, uh, and um, people should not be discouraged from participating because of, of that sort of conversation. All right, thank you so much, Garth. And Dennis, um, we'll, we'll end with you on this question. Uh, yeah, so um, during a couple of assessments, we were actually looking at, you know, uh, the processes that Garth keeps mentioning, you know, there, there's, there's processes in everything, you know, like no matter what it is you do in business or in government, there's a process on how people do things. And what we're looking at is the voting process from, you know, registration and eligibility all the way to publishing the votes and then all the technology that actually supports it, you know, because yes, we've been doing vote by mail since the Civil War, uh, but however, now we have some digital dependencies in, in this process as well, you know, so it opens up new lines of attack uh, for, some pop, for, for some adversaries. But what we've kind of discovered is, you know, fraud could be done, but to do it is a great amount of work there's a whole lot of risk involved and it's extremely difficult to scale. So whether you're actually gonna do it from a non-technical perspective or from a, a, a technical perspective, it's, it's very difficult to kind of scale up. And as soon as someone or some group decides that they're gonna try and start flexing that muscle, it's gonna raise alarm bells really fast at all sorts of different levels. Uh, you know, we looked at it from a lot of different perspectives, but. You know, I think those statistics that we've been seeing um, are right for a reason. You know, it's because it's it's not worth the the effort. You know, I, I don't see it happening, especially in a um, vote by mail state because of the fact that there's paper. You know, once you actually have that voter intent captured on that ballot, you even if things go crazy on the digital side, you can still fall back to paper and that that is really the, the integrity in the entire system. All right, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, so Janice, Dr. Green, I know that you had mentioned this um, in your previous question, um, but let's talk a little bit more about voter intimidation. Um, so there have been calls made to have citizens patrol polling stations and ballot drop boxes looking for voting fraud. Snohomish County currently allows the public to observe um, most portions of the election process. How is this different? Um, so Garth, as the, the county auditor, um, I'd love to kind of hear from you um, for this question. Yeah, so uh, in terms of our observation opportunities, so we, we are open to public observation. Uh, we provide a couple of trainings each year to provide an overview of the elections process for individuals and, and uh, highlight those, those areas of oper 
uh, observation that, that folks can take advantage of. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, it is a bit different than the call for, for uh, poll watching and um, for rallying around uh, ballot boxes and things like that. And so um, we, uh, in, in conversations that I'm having with people this year, I am encouraging them, if they want to come observe, that is that's certainly uh, an opportunity, reach out to our office. We can tell you those locations that you can go and, and when we'll be doing certain processes and, and provide that opportunity. If you are looking to organize around a ballot drop box and unofficially observe, um, the, the concern there is that you are going to be drawing a crowd to a box where we want to make sure that voters have access and can, can uh, get their ballot back in there um, uh, easily. And even a peaceful crowd is an intimidation for some people. So, um, you know, our, our call really is if you are interested in the voting process and observing, give us a call. We'll, uh, we'll share those opportunities. You can come watch as, as an, um, uh, an official observer or visitor. Uh, but uh, if, you are, if you're looking to do an independent um, kind of observation process, uh, we'd ask that you you not do that around the elections uh, specific sites, but uh, hold your, your rallies uh, elsewhere uh, in, in the county. All right, thank you, Garth. Um, and then Dr. Janice Green, um, if you can also talk about your understanding of this process and highlight how voter intimidation is impacting uh, communities of color and other vulnerable groups, both locally and nationally. nationally. So I totally agree. I think I said early, earlier that I think that uh, working within the rules and within the criteria and taking the training and ob uh, doing observation, I think that's good for our democracy. And I think that keeps the integrity in. But when you have people who are intimidating, uh, threatening, whether they have weapons or not, and, uh, and, and uh, just like he said, are, are coalescing around a ballot box or any other any other way that you get in to can interfere with somebody peacefully putting their ballot in place I think because of recent with the president calling for people to watch uh, or, or or monitor the polls or however he's putting it it gives people the indication that they can go they have the right to go and stand and watch those ballots being cast or they have the right to uh, the, the right to be there with their, their long guns and their rifles. I think that that's confusing to people. It's intimidating, it's suppressing. And I think that people think because he says it, it makes it so. And it's all right for them to do those type of things. So in this part of the country, I haven't noticed it, honestly. I have not noticed that around our, in Snohomish County uh, when it comes to voting. But when you watch what's going on nationally and you see the people with their mega hats, with their big guns, with their, you know, and, and it's, it's fierce the way that they come at people and, and people have stood up to that. I'm, I'm really happy to say that I see with even in Houston and, and um, Georgia and other places where they have been intimidated, where they have been suppressed, where the people have done everything in their power to make sure that the, that the people that they don't want to vote don't have the opportunity to vote. So watching this and watching the people then the resilience and the way that they stand up and the way that they refuse to have their vote discounted is, is, is great to see. Um, I mentioned earlier when I started about the voters' rights, um, the voters' rights of 1964. Um, yes, it was passed, but it's been gutted. And so I think the people need to stay on their legislators and make sure they put the protections back in that were taken out. So let's make sure that we, you know, it's, it's a bigger picture and we just need to make sure that we're supporting those folks too, supporting the people that are, are that need to vote or want to vote. Uh, I was watching some people are quite elderly and they refuse to be sat down and shut up. That's pretty much, I, you know, I, I'm grateful that we don't have to deal with that right now in Snohomish County. Although, you know, there has been some concerns voiced to me because of some of the things that have gone on in Snohomish uh, as far as ha allowing people their Second Amendment Act their rights and whether Second Amendment rights overpower people's freedom to vote and freedom of speech and other things. 
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Um, so let's talk about um, election security. Um, so recently, the FBI stated that sophisticated hackers were targeting state and local governments and had gained unauthorized access to election support systems. What could an adversary do with access to election systems and what protections are in place to detect and prevent these attacks? Um, so Dennis, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, so I mean, if an adversary has access to a system, I mean, it depends on kind of like what system they're particularly looking at. One of the benefits we actually have within our election systems from a digital perspective is, you know, you have the county systems that are separated from the state. And I'm going to stay away from polling stations in this example, um, because that's not what we do here in Washington State. And that's, uh, that's a little bit more tricky. However, um, you know, from a state per perspective, you know, you're really looking at the voting registration database, for example. Um, you know, you can actually possibly, with the right level of access, you can uh, do read-write functions. You know, can you possibly read everyone within those different roles and pull that file out? You know, that's been shown that a lot of that information is already publicly available. So an adversary wouldn't necessarily need to breach a database and, and do anything malicious in order to actually get that information. However, if they have right access, uh, then all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, there's different ways that you can possibly manipulate those votes. If you want to be a little bit more subtle and have a secondary effect like something like voter suppression, you can mix up the address numbers of everyone within that voting registration data database or within a part, part, uh, certain county, you know, so it actually interferes with the overall kind of voting process. Uh, you know, there's the publishing side where the results are actually published. You know, adversary with access to the web features could possibly, uh, you know, manipulate the output, you know, so and so wins when clearly, you know, that was not something that they're able to doing, you know. Um, but with that, you know, as long as here in Washington state, we have paper, you know, so regardless of what an adversary could potentially get access to, as long as voters are actually casting their ballots on paper, even if worst case scenario, all these systems go belly up and are compromised, you can actually execute a recount process. You have the integrity of the election there. And what's more, more frightening than an adversary actually having physical access to these systems is, you know, the perception, perception hacking, you know, the, the, the illusion that something greater has actually happened to these systems. So the fear, anxiety, and distrust of the system is actually something that actually goes rampant through social media. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, alerts and bulletins coming out of the law enforcement agencies, FBI, CIA, and uh, other agencies. And they're being monitored uh, both by uh, at a federal level, at state levels. Here in Washington state, we have kind of three layers of security on, on our state level systems where you have Department of Homeland Security monitoring uh, exterior traffic through their, uh, their sensor. We have the Secretary of State's office as a security operations center, which is made up of an amazing group of individuals who are monitoring the network uh, at that level. And then you also have uh, an augmented force of the National Guard and State Guard providing additional assessments and layers of security during these different elections. So the, there's a lot of security here digitally in Washington State. Um, and I feel very confident about uh, the different layers of security we have here. All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, Maggie, um, I'll go to you next. As our election uh, security expert, um, what could an adversary do with access to election systems and what protections are in place to detect and prevent these attacks? I'm afraid in this one, Dennis really nailed it. Uh, you know, I was going to say a, a few things. I was just going to echo a few things he said. For example, I would still want to know exactly what they fa accessed. For example, there was some rumor on Twitter that it was uh, voting records, I think, which uh, or like voter registration records, which are public documents, which makes it sound like the attack is a little overblown from what we have actually been, you know, achieved. Uh, though I will say one of the, the attacks I've heard about, and this is very anecdotal, it's not been really proven, was just that in Florida, there was some possibility that um, the polling place got scrambled for some people after the access to the voter registration system there. And that sent people to the wrong polling place, uh, maybe even a couple of times, uh, you know, so that they were, you know, practically in tears, you know, trying to vote and not knowing where they were supposed to go. And that would be something you would possibly do. Um, but again, uh, 
this isn't proven. And I wouldn't in good faith try to be like that also happened in Florida. So what could they do with these systems? It depends on what systems. It depends on the level of access they have. And again, uh, elections are unique in the sense that, you know, just the appearance of an attack, even if it failed, is an attack in and of itself. Uh, so I would always be very careful about augmenting uh, stories about certain attacks without caveats like, what do we actually know? How vulnerable was that document, you know, what they took? Um, and uh, and making sure that you know people like election officials uh, you know are aware of it and who can do something about it um, before and 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 this is something I bring up in a few talks I give elections are often misconstrued by headlines too like elections can be campaign security they can be election infrastructure security they can be reporting they can be um, uh, disinformation. So when you say that like an election got hacked, um, a lot of times what is said can be very different from what is heard. People almost always assume we mean tabulation, uh, but it isn't necessarily tabulation that gets access. It's not even necessarily, uh, you know, again, the uh, the reporting of the attack itself, of the attack itself can be its own attack. So uh, it, it makes it very difficult for election security experts sometimes to even raise awareness. And we've been attacked on that front ourselves in the past. So, um, but like I said, for the technical side of that, I think Dennis already nailed it and I would only be echoing him. All right, thank you, Maggie. Um, so we are approaching our last question. Um, I do wanna make sure that we have time for audience Q and A. Um, and again, to the audience, I encourage you to um, ask questions via the YouTube chat feature. Um, and then as a reminder, um, we just hope that this is a civil discourse. So please keep comments and questions respectful and appropriate. Um, so this question is for um, Dr. Janice Green and Garth. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, uh, if you can just keep your responses brief so we have time for audience Q&A, that would be great. Um, so we've seen numerous protests and counter protests focused on issues pertaining to racial and social injustice and police brutality. Acts of violence have become more common during these events. From your perspective, how are protests helping change the moral compass of America for this upcoming election? And how can misinformation contribute to the tension and acts of violence during protests post-election? And uh, Dr. Janice Green, we'll start with you. You're muted, ma'am. I think you're on mute, Dr. Green. Okay, um, we'll have uh, Garth um, if you can step in for this question um, and then we'll go back to Dr. Green. Yeah, yeah. So I, well, first I'll point out, I think uh, most people would agree that um, a founding principle of our democracy is, is freedom of speech and the, uh, the ability to gather and um, uh, to demonstrate and share ideas. And so uh, I think what we've seen this year um, in, in our country has, has probably contributed to uh, a lot of the interest in this election. So I think from just that perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a valuable conversation to be having. Um, and I think it's, it's prompting more people to participate. We've seen uh, here just in the first week since ballots were mailed out, uh, record early returns. Um, something three to four times what we would typically see in, in a presidential election in terms of ballots coming back. So, so I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. And, and I, I just hope that, hope that that continues throughout this elections process and we have a, a high overall turnout. So, um, how that, how that could feed into, uh, how misinformation could feed into post-election, um, activity and, um, um, uh, demonstrations, uh, you know, I think again, um, just making sure that people recognize that they should have confidence in their election system, and that 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 process is is safe and secure, and 
and um, and that we can demonstrate that as elections officials, I think, as well as is important. Um, I think that can go a long way to helping people uh, recognize that the results can be trusted, and and therefore, if the, the results can be trusted, then then uh, perhaps um, perhaps we can. Uh, uh, have uh, the, the, the conversation focused more on issues and, and, and things that we really do need to pull together to fix. So um, I, I hate to try to predict the future and what will happen post-election. I think, I think we'll wait and see, but uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, regardless of the outcome that um, people will, uh, again, uh, peaceably, um, peaceably gather and continue to to bring up questions and concerns and challenge challenge um, uh, what needs to change here uh, in, in the United States. So. All right, thank you, Garth. And uh, Dr. Green, if, if you're ready, um, yes. how are protests helping change the moral compass of America for this upcoming election? And how may misinformation contribute to the tension and acts of violence during protests post-election? So I think that uh, protest brings visibility to social injustice. I think that not only here and in the United States, but throughout the world. And with the things that have happened with George Floyd and, and others you know, just continually over a period of time, I think the visibility and the fact that people are acknowledging something that they denied in the past, and some people still deny that it's happening. Uh, they want to stay in their bubble and not acknowledge the social injustice and the racism, the things that take people to the streets to protest. I think that we need to be cautious when we talk about the violence, because even though peaceful protest, the violence isn't always happening on the protesters' side sometimes, and quite often you'll see this happening on the law enforcement with other folks as well. So we need to be cautious about understanding peaceful protests. We need to be cautious, cautious about assigning the violence to the protesters because as we've seen, uh, some of those protest those protesters may not be causing the violence. You've got in people infiltrating the protests, uh, hijacking the message, and it all falls back that the protesters are violent violent when it wasn't them that initiated the violence. And when this is over, and you know, I hear when I hear President Trump talk about what's going to happen if he doesn't win, he may not peacefully uh, turn over the reins to the new president if he loses. I think we all need to be very cautious because I see people walking around with their automatic weapons, with their mega hats on, and there may be some trouble, and I'm hoping that there's not. But I think we still need to pay attention to what's going on and not, um, you know, just not, just not lose focus. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, so now let's move into audience Q&A. Um, and we have quite a few questions. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're able to get to as many as possible. Um, so our first question, um, and Garth, this seems like a question for you. Is there a way for voters to check that their vote was counted? So uh, there's a way that voters can check to see that their ballot has been received by our office, that the signature has been accepted, and that the ballot has been um, moved forward for counting. Uh, you are entitled to a private ballot, so we do not know, we can't tell you that your, uh, your individual votes, how those, how those were counted. We don't know how they were counted. Um, that we can't match them back to you. So we, we can tell you though that your ballot was accepted for counting and if it was accepted for counting, it gets pushed down the machines. Um, we have a, an accountability uh, and an audit trail for all the ballots that come in. And, and as part of our certification process, uh, we're verifying that every ballot that gets accepted is counted. And uh, to do that, uh, I guess would probably be the other important detail. Uh, you can go to votewa.gov to check the status of your ballot and to uh, see, see that it's been received and accepted. And if for some reason uh, we have not accepted it because perhaps you forgot to sign the outside of the envelope or perhaps your signature did not match, um, that information will be available there as well. And uh, in Washington state, voters have a second opportunity to cure those issues and get those resolved. Uh, before we certify the election. And for this election, we'll be certifying 
on November uh, 24th. So you have until five o'clock on November 23rd to, to get those issues resolved. But uh, it's a great reason why you want to vote early and get your ballot in early to make sure you have plenty of time to resolve any issues that might pop up. Great, thank you. Um, also, um, the next question, I believe, um, a question for you, Garth. Um, does anyone know if Washington state has already begun counting the votes that have come in or does our state wait until election day to begin the count? So uh, by law, we're able to um, accept ballots and do all of the signature checking process uh, to uh, separate the ballots from the outside envelopes and then and visually inspect the ballots to make sure the equipment will properly uh, register uh, the marks on the ballot. And we can also, in, in most counties, depending on the type of technology that's being used for vote counting, uh, scan the ballots to create an image of the ballot, both the front and back of the ballot. Uh, we cannot, however, uh, uh, push the buttons that actually tabulate the results until eight o'clock on election night. So uh, the earlier you get your ballot in, the, the uh, sooner we can start that process. And the more ballots that are in, um, before eight o'clock on election night, the more robust our election results will be. Uh, in Washington state, you uh, do have until eight o'clock at election night to put your ballot in a drop box or your ballot just needs to be postmarked by election day. So if people are returning their ballots through the mail uh, on Monday and Tuesday, uh, that can extend our counting period out. And uh, so uh, my recommendation is if uh, if you're getting to that last weekend, uh, best to put it in a drop box and get it to us that way to make sure that it's in uh, before election day and, and on election day so we can get it as part of that uh, eight o'clock uh, election count. Great, thank you so much. Um, next question is for Dr. Uh, Janice Green. Um, you had mentioned um, weapons at the polls. Um, is there heightened security measures this year, or is there information that leads you to believe that this will be happening? Dr. Green, I think you're muted again. Yeah. Sorry about that. I said, um, yes, I did mention that, but I also mentioned that I don't think we have that issue in, in Snohomish County. I think when I talk mainly because we do mail and voting and there's few places that are open. But when I was taught what I was talking about weapons at the poll, I'm talking about a national level. I'm talking about what I see on the news. And I also see what uh, I hear what uh, President Trump is calling for when he has asked for poll watchers that's different than the folks that are observing legally. So that's my that was my comment. I don't think that we have that happening in Snohomish County, but I do see the opportunity for that to happen nationally. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about ballots. Um, so this is a scenario here. Um, an acquaintance of mine who moved to Arizona received two ballots from Washington State, um, an old house and new. Why would the state send him a ballot in Arizona? Um, he also received one in Arizona also. Um, if any of our panelists could speak to that, um, that would be great. I can, I can start. So uh, when you register to vote, a voter registration is done at a state level. And so um, uh, states uh, have uh, formed different groups where they share information back and forth to make sure that uh, people aren't registered in multiple states. Uh, we're, uh, Washington State's part of a group called ERIC, which is a, a group of, I think, 35 states at this point, which share the information from our databases um, in an anonymized way to, to make sure people aren't registered in more than one state. But uh, if, if a group's not part of the ERIC program or if we don't get that information uh, through the ERIC program that you've registered in another state, there is a potential that somebody could be registered in, in two states for a period of time. Um, uh, the reason somebody might get a ballot twice in, in Washington state is if you have an address change or a name change after the initial file is generated to, that we use to mail ballots out from, 
uh, you may get a second ballot that uh, is, is a reissued ballot for your new address. And so depending on, on that person's situation and when they changed addresses, if they're changing addresses pretty frequently, they may get a second ballot. Uh, when that second ballot is issued, the first ballot is suspended in the system. So if it comes back, the system will not allow us to accept it without manually inspecting it and determining if that voter has already voted or not. Uh, if you haven't voted and you do return that, that first ballot and not the second ballot, we can go ahead and accept it and we'll only count the issues that you're eligible for at your new address though. So uh, there are safeguards in place to make sure that everybody has that opportunity to vote. Um, in, this, in this case with uh, two ballots from uh, two different states, uh, again, I would encourage everybody to only vote once. Um, you should not be voting in multiple states. Um, and uh, we do uh, conduct cross checks between uh, uh, different states to, to verify um, those registrations. And again, not all states are part of, of the system we're part of, but uh, I believe at this point 35 r and in Arizona, um, uh, Arizona is, uh, I believe, one of those states, uh, but the, the data isn't checked in real time. It's done um, on a periodic basis. And so if that's a very recent registration, it may be that um, that the systems have not had that uh, uh, check um, here in the last uh, two to two to three weeks. So, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, there's some questions about uh, voter suppression. So, is the perception that our voting systems are compromised a significant factor in voter suppression? And how can we better affirm our system and prevent the perception um, that it is weak? Um, maybe Dr. Green, let's let's start with you. Oops. Yes, I think that it is um, a way of suppression. It gives people the idea that their vote really doesn't count. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I think that's been propagated through several means uh, through uh, social media through government officials. Uh, I think that we need to really pay attention to that and make sure that people do more outreach and let people know that our voting system is safe, that their vote will be counted and that they're receiving misinformation. And I think the more that we, we keep that uh, conversation going and the more that we fact check and the more that we share what's really going on. I'm really appreciating the folks that are on this call that are our auditors and people that really look into the votes and give, they give great answers. And I think that we just need to continue with that conversation. I don't think there's a way that we stop it entirely, but we should all be informed voters and we should be informing those that are around us. I mean, the only way to really guarantee that your vote won't count is not to vote. So congratulations right. on doing the bad guys work for them. If you <laughs> decide not to vote, you've also saved them money because millions are spent on this kind of disinformation campaign. And I believe in making the bad guys pay a lot of money and not succeeding. So uh, definitely you have the right to tell your friends they're stupid if they are buying into that. That was actually, and, 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 and joking aside, the idea that your vote's not going to count because um, uh, you know, it, the, the tabulation is going to be changed or something like that was an actual disinformation campaign we recently discovered in 2016, actually in many cases tragically targeted at men of color uh, and, and people of color. And it's just, you know, uh, don't please don't buy into it. I, I also saw one the other day that really got my got my gum got me angry. <laughs> PG version. Uh, so, uh, which was that like, oh, it's also patriotic to not vote at all, to not participate at all. Uh, that's your choice. And um, Sure, uh, if that's your belief, but that was actually a Russian, that was literally a Russian disinformation campaign in 2016. So I would ask you people to not buy into that very reasonable sounding line. Uh, and, and also no reputable election security expert is going to tell you that there's rampant tabulation fraud, that nothing will ever matter in this sort of nihilistic view. Uh, if they're saying that, they're not experts. I've never heard an expert say that. Great, thank you both. Um, so another, question about voter suppression. Um, I hear claims that requiring an ID is somehow a form of voter suppression due to cost. Um, didn't the US send out stimulus checks? Um, why not ID voucher program? IDs cost less than stimulus checks. Um, 
if anyone on the panel wanted to, to take this question. I don't, I don't know about uh, ID voucher programs, but I do know that requiring an ID has been a form of voter suppression, whether or not people can afford it, whether they have the actual paperwork in, that they need. And that changes sometimes depending on how uh, they, what, what's required, depending on how they want to suppress the vote. And yes, I think an ID voucher program would be a great idea. Great, thank you, Dr. Green. Um, others on the panel, um, if you wanted to contribute to this question. Yeah, any any sort of financial barrier to voting is traditionally considered what we would call a poll tax. And so anything that requires money to allow you to vote or as a barrier is um, almost universally struck down uh, in courts as a poll tax uh, because of how it's been used for voter suppression in the past. Uh, though it hasn't been in Florida with the um, the felons having their, uh, their um, fines and and I've found that absolutely horrifying and astounding uh, because it's so clearly a poll tax in this case. Um, I would basically say, hey, there's a lot, there's plenty of reason why people might not be able to get the ID. Like for example, if a driver's license is required, you might not need to drive. You might not have a car. Uh, you might live in a city. Uh, you might not, you might be elderly and you don't need to drive anymore, or you're not in a position to drive anymore. There's plenty of reasons not to have, for example, a driver's license as an ID. Um, some states will, like New York State, will give you a free, you know, voter registration card that you can bring in. Um, and in fact, in New York State, for example, it's illegal to ask for an ID, a, a photo ID. Uh, because of how it's been used in the past for voter suppression. So uh, to your point about, oh, there's federal stimulus money, oh, we'll give some sort of, you know, money to pay this poll tax for people somehow, which is just sounds rampantly corruptible to me. Uh, yeah. Federal government doesn't have any control over elections. The states run their elections. So uh, you, there is nothing the federal government could do in that respect to tell states. I mean, I guess they could do some sort of registration system in general, like an automatic voter registration system, which I would be certainly in favor of. But um, this idea that this federal government could mandate or give money for this for anything and a state would automatically adopt it is, is not something that automatically happens. States control their own elections and jealously guard the right to do so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, here's another question. I know um, that there are too many people who won't vote. Um, they don't feel like their vote matters one way or the other. Um, the, poor bo the poor voter turnout that we have in the US is sad. Um, what about making it a law that people must vote? Um, let's see, maybe Dennis, um, let's start with you. Thanks. Uh, first off, I'm not a, a legal expert, um, so making it a law to, to vote is um, a little bit uh, out of my area. Um, but the, the fact that people are saying that they don't, their vote doesn't matter is is showing that the just the kind of toxic media system that we have, our political system with this back and forth kind of aggressive rhetoric and the misinformation that really kind of amplifies the divisions that we have in our country. It shows me that it's working and that that makes me feel terrible. Uh, we should all be enthusiastic to vote, uh, try and be as informed as we possibly can. It's very difficult in this environment where so much media, so much information is flooding our, our social media streams and, and we're just becoming more and more divided due to the ongoing campaigns of misinformation that we've seen over the last four years. Uh, I would, I would strongly suggest to these individuals that take a deep breath, you know, uh, you know, like my, my four-year-old when she kind of has a, a moment, you know, take a deep breath, count to four, re-energize and re-engage, you know, but, but look at things differently. Like start looking at your information stream, start getting more educated about the disinformation kind of coming in here. Start fact-checking things a little bit more. Question what it is you're reading and the intent, because there are people out there, both local and overseas that actually don't want us to go out and vote. And uh, as Maggie said, we're not going to let them win. All right, I would love to hear um, others. Um, Garth, on this question about- Yeah, yeah certainly there are, there are other countries that have compulsory voting and they, they you know, uh, issue a fine of, of some sort uh, if, if you're not participating. 
Um, but uh, I, I, I prefer myself the uh, let's let's incentivize and, and and make sure that people understand why voting is important and and make sure that we have a system that uh, does allow people to elect uh, those those individuals that do represent uh, uh, their beliefs and their ideas and their uh, dreams and hopes and and uh, just continue to to continue working on that aspect of this process. Um, I think. Uh, again, I, I would just echo what Dennis was saying in terms of misinformation. It's it's so easy to to um, uh, take that uh, the information we're hearing through social media, through um, uh, other forms, and and uh, internalize that and and say that we can't make a difference. But the, the truth is, you really do make a difference when you vote, and your voice does matter. And um, and uh, rather than uh, making this a compulsory let's let's join together and, and continue to work on on making a better process and a better system in which our voices can be heard cool. all right and um we'll end with dr green on this question and then um we will have to wrap up audience q a um thank you all for submitting your questions um but we do want to ensure that our student um, who has waited so patiently to give a testimony has time to speak. So uh, Dr. Green, um, would love to hear your opinions on that question. I hear this a lot when people say that they don't think their vote would count, so why should they bother? And I agree with the people that spoke before me that a lot of that's been on misinformation. Um, one of the things I think people need to really pay attention to is how narrow, mar what the narrow margins are with people winning elections and if they vote and others vote, I think that that, that would change. So as far as a, making a law that people vote, I don't see that happening. Um, not sure that I'd even want that to happen. I'd rather have it be through incentivizing and people understanding why they're voting and who they're voting for and understanding the issues. But I do hear that quite often that people don't vote because they don't think that their vote counts. Great, thank you all so much. Um, so now I wanna introduce um, Giga Aki. Um, he's an Everett Community College student. And this is an exciting time for uh, both him and us. He will register to vote for the first time at the end of the panel. Um, and of course he will be encouraging all of the viewers to do so as well for those who haven't. Um, so I would like to welcome him to the virtual stage and he will share a little bit about himself and the importance of voting in this election. Hi there, um, Hamad El Kik. Um, I usually go by Giga. Um, can you guys hear me? Perfect. Um, I go by Giga. Um, I do reverse engineering for a living. Um, I recently started my own startup Kickbox that focuses on malware, uh, malware detection and prevention. Um, I will be sharing with you my story from coming to the US, uh, becoming a resident, and then a US citizen, and then lastly but not least, um, voting for the first time in my life. Um, and of course, I, I'm, I'm really grateful and thank you all. I learned a lot of things and I'm confident after listening to you guys, I'm confident that I'm going to do that more than ever. So um, I came to the US in 2014. Um, I was happy because um, I'm finally with my wife. Um, when I got here, um, I tried to find a job in reverse engineering. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a job in reverse engineering. Um, and my wife mentioned, hey, why, did you, why didn't you check EVCC? And my wife used to work at EVCC. She was program specialist at the job center. Um, so I said, yeah, why not? We'll check it out. Um, I did my research. I researched about EVCC. Um, it all made sense to me. I was super happy about um, programs, instructors, and how small those classes. Um, it, it was it, it made sense to me to study at EVCC. So I started studying at EVCC um, in 2015, in the middle of 2015. Um, I still remember my first class. It was Compitia A+, and the instructor was Diane. I liked the atmosphere. Um, she did an awesome job. Um, later on, I got to meet Dennis. 
And Dennis was my counselor at the time. I know Dennis. I annoyed him <laughs> every time I show up to Dennis. Hey, yeah. <laughs> can you check this? Can you check that? Um, so Dennis provided guidance. Like he really helped. He helped with my. Uh, he helped. Uh, he helped me with my resume. He helped me with my LinkedIn, even programs, classes, what to take, what not. Besides other instructors as well. Um, so. Afterward, I advanced in uh, EVCC. I did a good job. Um, I took more classes and I applied for uh, my permanent residence. And then uh, at the end of 2016, because of all the effort that instructors at EVCC did, I was able to land my first job with a big antivirus company. Um, at the time, it was the biggest antivirus company. I don't know now. But that was amazing. I also um, got a few offers, but I decided to go with the offer because it was amazing. Um, so went and worked there. Um, very interesting experience. In 2017, I graduated from AVCC um, as outstanding graduate. So proud, all the hard work, all the effort they put, waking up on nights, <laughs> solving stuff. Yeah, it worked out. I was so super excited about it. Um, bought our first house in Vancouver, Washington. So we had to move. We used to live in Middlesville um, and we had to move um, to Vancouver, Washington. Um, so at the end of 2018, and this is how life, ha life is ups and downs. So in 2018, um, the company decided to close their office. Um, I wasn't... Uh, that mean that I lost my job, um, but I had to take a really fast decision, which is going to Austin, Texas for a different job. I didn't do a lot of research, so I had to take that decision. Um, we learned from our mistakes. I went there six months and then came back. Um, when I came back, I focused more on my citizenship. And I really want that citizenship. I wanted that citizenship because it will give me the option to vote, to participate in this democracy. So it was, it was something that I wanted. Um, so I put effort in that, um, a lot of follow, uh, a lot of follow-ups, a lot of uh, paperwork to, um, to finish. And yeah, so it was, it was really lengthy process, but um, in 2019, um, at the beginning of 2019, um, we lost some family members. It was um, really sad for us, but Again, this is life, ups and downs. Um, sometimes you lose someone, sometimes you don't. So anyway, um, in the middle of 2019, I became a US citizen. And when I came a US citizen, I was, yep, <laughs> I was going crazy. <laughs> the first thing came to mind, oh my gosh, I can apply and I can, uh, first thing came, oh, I can uh, vote. And then I can apply for jobs in the government sector. Oh, I can work in the National Guard. Oh, I can work in the Air Force. I had a lot of things, a lot of ideas that was going crazy, that were going crazy in my mind. and. Lastly, but not least, I was thinking, hey, why not just, I can even have in my own business. Why not having my own thing going on? So anyway, um, I started doing that. I um, went over my hard drives, collected some uh, closed source projects that I did in the past. I open sourced them and I pushed them to GitHub. And then afterward, I opened my own business in the field. Um, associated all the projects with the uh, GitHub account. So that's that's amazing. Um, I opened the business. I know nothing about business, but I know one thing. If I fail, I will try again. I will try again and try again. And one day I'm going to succeed. That's it. Um, so um, at the end of this, um, and I know it's 2020, um, there have been a lot of things going on. I would love to have better future and this is why i'm going to vote and i know things won't change without voting things won't change we have to vote and this is why i'm going to vote and yeah thank you again thank you all for having me and oh yeah i'm going to vote actually in five minutes i'm going to vote online so excuse me <laughs> bye
All right. Thank you so much for your words. And we're so excited that you will be participating in this year's election. You are an inspiration to us all. Um, so I do want to thank our president, Dr. Willis, our panelists and their expertise, um, our interpreters, and of course, our audience who gave up their evening to spend time with us and learn about voter misinformation and suppression. I also want to give a special thanks to Ryan uh, Massinelli um, in the CIS department at Everett Community College for making it happen on the technical side and ensuring that we had a successful streaming on YouTube. Um, thank you, Catherine Schiffner, who's our public relations director for helping me moderate comments on YouTube. And thank you to her marketing staff for all the help they did to promote the event. Um, so we wanted this to be a learning opportunity and a call to action, a call for all of you to realize how much your voice matters in shaping the world that you live in. And I hope you take this call to action to heart and vote. For those who have, thank you. And for those who haven't, um, there's still time. So have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Good night and thank you. Thank you.